Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick revision of Macbeth Act 5, scenes 6 to 9. And I'm covering these final four scenes because it cracks along at a heck of a pace. Scene 6 is really short, 10 lines long. And part of the reason for its inclusion is to create this juxtaposition of place within the play. We've got this dramatic shift in the conclusion of the play um, that creates tension and helps to convey the inevitability of Macbeth's downfall by alternating between Dunsinane and Malcolm's army. We're getting these dramatic counterpoints that also develop the energy as we shift our focus from one place to the next. So in scene one, we've got Dunsinane, two, Malcolm's army, three, Dunsinane, four, Malcolm's army, five, Dunsinane, six, Malcolm's army. So we're constantly shifting our focus, getting a sense of the tension as it builds and seeing the reactions in both camps. Scene seven begins with Macbeth Beth stating, they've tied me to a stake, I cannot fly, but bear I comes to fight the course. And this is an allusion to the popular Elizabethan sport of bear baiting, where the bear was set on by dogs. Usually the bear was tied down, as you can see in this image, so that um, it's impossible for the bear to escape. And it's really a case of deciding how long it's going to take for the bear to die. But Beth is metaphorically referring to himself as the bear, something powerful, a force, but something that's been constrained by exterior forces. In this case, the English lords and the rebels led by Malcolm and Macduff. So there's an inevitability, an acceptance of his own death, I would argue, at this point. Uh, the metaphor suggests that the end is only a matter of time. Young Seward enters the scene, and Macbeth is referred to through, once again, the semantic field of hell. So Young Seward calls him a name hotter than any is in hell, and the devil himself. So, once again, we've got a clear sense that Macbeth is seen as diabolical. Macbeth kills young Seward very easily and laughs at what he's done. Thou wast born of woman, reminding us again of the fact that Macbeth feels this sense of invulnerability as a result of the premonitions that he's been subject to. The arrogance and hubris is hammered home in swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, because they're carried by someone that's of a woman born. Macduff's desperate to strike at Macbeth. He says, I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. He wants to get Macbeth. Now, those wretched kerns are the kind of foot soldiers that have been hired as mercenaries from Ireland. So he doesn't want to waste his strokes on these people who are being just paid to fight. The interesting thing, however, is that Kearns have been referred to before in the play. In Act 1, Scene 2, the merciless MacDonald, the traitor that Macbeth was fighting at the beginning of the play, was supplied with Kearns. So we get this kind of intratextual allusion back to Act 1, Scene 2, and everything seems to have become cyclical. Now it's Macbeth that's that traitor who's supplied by Kearns, um, when he was fighting the Kearns against the traitor at the beginning of the play. Everything's been reversed. And Shakespeare draws the audience's attention to the fact that the hero has become the traitor. Scene 8 begins with Shakespeare re-establishing the bravery of Macbeth. He says, why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword, whilst I see lives the gashes do better upon them? In other words, he feels that the still damage that he can do to his enemies... Um, the Romans would rather take their own lives than suffer defeat, but Macbeth's rejecting that as foolish. He can inflict harm on his enemies, no matter what the outcome for him. Unsurprisingly, as soon as Macduff enters, he uses that semantic field of hell to address Macbeth again. Turn, hellhound, turn. And to make it even more profound, he uses this zoomorphic comparison as well. The Macbeth's a hellhound, a specific creature of hell that's dehumanized, as well as being rendered something satanic. Macduff and Macbeth begin to fight, and Macbeth's arrogance is presented by Shakespeare in uh, his statements, Thou losest labour. Uh, Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. Reinforcing the words of the apparitions, suggesting that um, he has this invulnerability, and uh, that fosters his arrogance as well. Macduff is not going to be able to attack or kill him. Macduff counters this by revealing that he was born by Caesarian, fulfilling that prophecy of the second apparition. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. 
On hearing this news, Macbeth says that it hath cowed my better part of man. In other words, the news has undermined his confidence. Now he's finally got to accept that he's been tricked by the witches. And he articulates this in these juggling fiends no more be believed than palter with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. In other words, he recognises that the witches have juggled with their words, cheating him with ambiguities and equivocations. That word equivocations, one that we've come across time and time again in the play, that they've played with words, they've used double meanings in order to trick him and make him do their bidding. Uh, The antithetical parallelism highlights the contrast between the hopes created by the witches and the destruction of these hopes. Despite Macduff calling Macbeth a coward, Shakespeare reinforces Macbeth's bravery at this stage. Even now that he's accepted all of the prophecies as being fulfilled, he still refuses to accept his fate. And as in Act 1, Scene 2, he goes on to disdain fortune. He attacks Macduff. Shakespeare begins the final scene with a huge contrast to Macbeth's rule. We get Malcolm's first words being selfless and full of compassion. He's concerned about his friends, he's concerned about his comrades. I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. Macduff enters the scene with Macbeth's head. Um, So it's worth recognising that Macbeth's killed off stage, maybe to deny him the pity and honour that an onstage death could afford. It's worth recognising that the power of the supernatural is still evident. This beheading was potentially foreshadowed by the armoured head apparition in Act 4. And Macduff goes on to state, Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head, reminding the audience of Macbeth's crimes, the crime of usurping the throne. And the consequence of these is dramatically evident in that brandishing of Macbeth's head, a really powerful dramatic statement. Shakespeare grants the final words of the play to Malcolm when he states, We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with our several loves. He's presenting Malcolm as a king of action, not procrastination. His actions are immediate, and they're also just. Again, a contrast to Macbeth. Later, when he says, This dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who as tis fought by self and violent hands, took off her life, we get this emotive noun, butcher, which vilifies Macbeth, and the semantic field of hell is applied to Lady Macbeth this time, fiend-like. Malkin's expressing the belief here that Lady Macbeth took her own life, the first time actually that we're told explicitly about that in the play. And finally, he says that calls upon us by the grace of grace we will perform in measure. Malcolm's using the language of heaven, contrasting with the language of hell that's always been ascribed to Macbeth in the latter stages of the play. The audience is essentially assured that Malcolm will be a righteous king and order will be restored. Okay, ta.